Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Hi okay, everyone, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, I've been looking forward to this podcast for a little while. I uh, have someone in the studio who has been a long friend of Smart Property Investment, Momentum Media here, uh, from Core Logic Head of Research, Tim Lawless. Tim, how are you going? Yeah, well, Phil, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, it's great to be here, mate. Normally I'd have some sort of long-winded preamble conversation to try and give context to what we're going to chat about today, but uh, I think the title, Head of Research, Core Logic, uh, I think people know what we're going to be talking about. I'd imagine every property investor, I'd imagine you'd like to think so, knows of uh, Core Logic and what you guys do, and hopefully use your uh, insights and uh, uh, and analysis to help make buying decisions. Um, are you the guy that's sort of in charge of putting all that stuff out? Is that what you do? Well, pretty much. I uh, uh, I'm not the guy that builds the models. Mm. We have really really smart people that do that. So I'm more the person that uh, that takes all those outputs from uh, from our indices and our models. And tries to make sense of what they mean. Uh, so we, we we build a lot of graphs, we write a lot of commentary, we put out a lot of reports. But a big part of what uh, what my team does is really just try to decipher what's happening in the housing market, blend all our indices with other data, uh, economic data, demographic data, just to try to paint, I guess, a more holistic picture of where the market's been and where it's likely to be going from here. And we'll try and tackle that today. Uh how do we get to where we are today and what's the future look like? Uh, my point around um, uh, most property investors uh, having used or being aware of core logic, uh, you guys have got pretty pretty good coverage right right across Australia when it comes to this stuff. Yeah, across a whole bunch of different segments as mm. well. So a lot of people would, would know core logic as RP data, um, our, our previous branding. And uh, back in 2011, we were acquired by uh, core logic, an American company, which uh, we're now part of the world's largest property data and analytics company. So very, very good good place to be as an analyst. But also when we look at the different segments that we work in, you know, our biggest uh, growth segment is banking and finance. So we do a lot of work with the banks uh, around risk mitigation, around valuations work, around uh, identifying opportunities, streamlining the mortgage process application as well. But also with real estate agents, of course, mortgage brokers, valuers, consumers and government are really the main segments we work in. And then also in our non-residential side of the business, which is Cordell, CityScope, uh, Property Information Monitor, all our non-residential products. So they feed obviously into developers, into builders, um, commercial leasing agencies and so forth as well. So it's quite the gambit. But uh, I think anybody looking to buy a property should absolutely be accessing this sort of data. You know, just just to, to drill down to the micro level is really important as an investor. Looking at all the trends, uh, be it to say even macro down to suburb level trends are really important. But if you're making a decision that's costing you hundreds of thousands of dollars, you really want to be looking at the nuts and bolts. Looking at, well, what did the property sell for previously? How long has it been on the market? Are the vendors maybe getting a little bit uh, more inclined to, to discount their prices or what's your negotiation position like? And what are properties doing around the property you're looking at? Are they selling? Are they on the market for longer? What's their sales history? What's the, the ownership profile? Are there more investors? Are there owner occupiers? All that sort of stuff um, is is what we would generally find property investors be using IP data for. So give some context to property investors. Property investors always want more. I'm one of them. Uh, and we always want stuff for free. Uh, and that's the way it is. But to give some context globally, is the sophistication of the tools available to the average property investor in Australia, how does it stack up to um, other OECD countries, for example, like England or, or the US? Do we have better analytics here as the just a common consumer versus our counterparts in other parts of the world? It's, it's similar. I'll, I'll, I'll go that far initially. So it really comes back to data. Um, analytics obviously build on, on data availability. Mm. So in Australia, we are very lucky that we have a very transparent, um, well-regarded title system. Each of the state governments, uh, every single property that transacts in Australia, that, that record is collected by the state government, and they sell that to data um, aggregators like, like ourselves. Uh, so it really comes back to them. What do we do with that base level of data? It, 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 it comes back to matching it up with other sets of data. So think about um, the typical property transaction we'll see in Australia, the government record that comes through, it'll have a few key pieces of information. It'll have what the property sold for, um, the date it sold on, the price, uh, sometimes who purchased it and who sold it, but, but not in every state. It'll have the property identifier, so the lot and plan number. Uh, generally, will show the size of the lot sold. Um, but, but getting really important information like how many bedrooms does the property have, how many bathrooms, 
What's its elevation? What's the zoning on the property? That's all additional information we need to then plug onto that property record. So even though our state-based uh, transactional data is the real base of our, um, our property record system, it's matching that data up with listings information, with town planning data, with uh, demographic information, economic information, building approvals data, all that sort of stuff, which really paints the whole picture of the housing market and gives you a much clearer and transparent view of the property. Now, if you look at other markets around the world, the US is probably the best example. They do have a very similar title system, but they don't have the same level of transparency uh, and level of detail in their property re records. But they do have some additional information. For example, every single property record in the US, you can see how much debt is held against it, for example. What, it, what, what is there a lien against the property and so forth, which is something that we're missing here in Australia. And as we move towards positive credit reporting, we'll start to get a bit more visibility around how much debt is held against a property. So you can see how leveraged people are. Absolutely. It's all publicly available. It's all publicly available. And uh, you know you can work out oh, equity and, yeah. and so forth. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's very different. What a great buying tool. So you can go through there and see who's sort of... Uh, uh, over leveraged and in negative equity and try and pick yourself up a bargain, I guess. But this is the power of data. That's the power of data. And blending our data sets with other data sets is really where, where it's at now. Big data, is that's what it's all about, is blending uh, uh, data sets from all over the place, bring it into one central location, and then really start wringing the value out of it. Mm. What do you guys got coming down line for property investors? You're always doing your updates and whether it's through acquisition or, or you're um, bringing in new data sets into your current uh, modelling, you, you're always doing something new. Uh, what was the next exciting thing coming down the line for property investors? Well, there's probably a couple of things. One would be along the line of our analytics. So we, we're always uh, building new indices and, and, and raising the bar in the way we measure property. Mm. So our hedonic index, which is really well known, it's how we, we track housing markets across the capital cities and across standardised regions, we're starting to apply that same methodology down to more granular levels now, suburbs, postcodes, council areas, um, and even customised boundaries. So you can start to see, well, uh, waterfront properties are performing non-waterfront properties, for example. What's happening with properties with uh, with with, with um, uh, large slopes on them, for example? Are they, are they generally discounted? And if so, by how much? So really fine-tuning um, our analytics across uh, different geographies and different housing types. Some of the tools that investors should, should be expecting to use these days, very much now come back to spatial tools. So, so mapping applications and overlaying different data sets across um, a, a geographical context. Mm. Really important, uh, you know, you start to see a whole new view of the housing market when you start to see what does it look like uh, when, when you overlay the geography. Uh, uh, forget about suburb boundaries or postcode boundaries. If you can start viewing trends on a map, you know, in, in the context of other geographical um, boundaries like rivers, waterways, railways, School zones, for example, uh, give you a whole new view on, on the housing market. It's good that all this information's available right now and it just seems to be more and more coming on. But um, one of the traps that a lot of investors find themselves in is that they just keep researching and overanalyze, right? The fact that you can look at gradients of slopes and work out what the discounting might be on a stuff like that's all good and you can use these as tools. But often for a lot of investors, they get stuck and they never do anything because they overanalyze um, because of the data available. You know, as a researcher, your job is to provide this into market, but you must see property investors who never get there and never actually buy something because they just put too much emphasis on the data. Well, what's your recommendations around that? It's, it's actually really common mm. and and people call it analysis paralysis, right? You're, you're just stuck just, just trying to work out your numbers way too much. I think absolutely, uh, research is really important. Mm. Get, getting your, your numbers right, investment is all about the numbers and uh, taking some of the emotion out of it or all the emotion out of it. But at the end of the day, you've got to make a decision. You've got to go with your instinct in some time, uh, in some conditions. Even uh, you know when everything stacks up, you're still going to have choice of which properties actually fit your consideration set and then you need to choose amongst them. Then it comes down to negotiating. So. Generally, the best the best advice I can give is is act mm. right. Do do your research, but but execute, follow through. And we're obviously chatting about investors. Uh, real estate agents use this data differently to mortgage brokers. They use it differently to developers. But as as property investors, how do the best property investors use data to get to a decision making process the quickest or the easiest or the smoothest? Is there any particular top line data they should be making sure they do cover? And that should be enough to get going or, you know, what's the best that you see? 
I think most investors generally have an idea of where they would like to buy. Mm. But it, that's, that's always a good place to start is distilling down where, where you want to buy your property at. Uh, so there's, there's plenty of ways to do that. You can look at all the suburb level detail. You can look at the capital city level detail and start drilling down from there. Mm. And most investors will be looking at things like, well, are prices going up or down? Is there any momentum in the market? That this might show you where the trends are heading, what's happening with the volume, how much supply is in, is in, uh, in the pipeline, or how many homes are being advertised for sale. Once you start to get an idea of the geography that you'd be targeting and the housing type is going to be a house or an apartment or a townhome or a villa, then you can really start looking at the fine tuning of, well, which property is right for me and my budget. So that, that obviously going to start looking at the portals, uh, realestate.com or domain uh, uh, on the house, trying to find the properties that are available, they're going to meet your, your requirements. And from there, you're probably going to get a short list of properties that are suitable for you to purchase and that's where you really not, need to start nutting out the numbers on those individual properties. How long have they been held for? So how long have they been owned? How long have they been on the market for? What sort of negotiation might be able to uh, apply in, 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 these, in these properties when I'm looking to buy them? What sort of rental market conditions am I looking at? So the vacancy rate's going to be low enough to ensure I'm attracting a tenant all the time. Mm. So there's a lot of that information. And you can look at the suburb level trends. But once again, there's no, uh, I suppose, um, replacement for actually doing the numbers on an individual property. The trends are always going to give you some guidance, but the numbers on the individual property are really what investors should be making their decisions on. So investors will be sitting and going, oh, this is really good. Where do I buy a property? So as, as head of research, do you actually provide uh, your sentiments, the company's sentiments on the best buying locations? Do you, go, do you go that far? Do you say these are the best suburbs and these type of assets that you should be looking at? Uh, we, we do and we don't. Mm. Obviously, there's there's a fine line between uh, um, analysing the market and providing advice. So, yeah. so we're not in the advice business. But absolutely, if I look around Australia at the moment and really broad level, I'd be saying, well, Southeast Queensland's looking like a pretty good marketplace to me. Relatively affordable, very strong migration, population growth. Uh, rental yields tend to be not, not, too, not too bad, but mm. well, particularly in relativity to Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, and we're still seeing some stability in prices there. We're not seeing prices falling. Sure, they're not shooting the lights out either. They're, they're rising roughly in line with inflation. But if you look at all the elements in Southeast Queensland, that looks pretty good to me. Adelaide's looking very stable. Perth and Darwin still going down, but prices have become very affordable in those markets, mm. uh, particularly in Darwin. Rental yields have, have shot through the roof as well. So I think investors will start to look at some of those markets that are look, looking like quite good buying opportunities now. Some of the lifestyle markets around the country, think of areas like the Gold Coast or Sunshine Coast, uh, Coffs Harbour, Byron, those sort of markets seem to be uh, um, defying this downturn as well. We are seeing a lot of demand coming into the lifestyle market, probably fueled by uh, a lot of cashed up homeowners coming out of Sydney and Melbourne, who can now once again uh, get, get back into their sea change that they might have had to cancel back in 2008. Uh, and also some of the, the regional areas that have been more connected to the mining uh, sector yeah. have also bottomed out now. You know, I was just looking at some numbers on Caratha this morning. The, the, the number of sales in Caratha is up 14% over the past 12 months. We've seen values rise about 10% since they bottomed out uh, in 2017. But of course, they're about 60% below where they were back in 2012. So yeah. I think a few investors who might be a little bit more risk inclined would be targeting some of these mining regions as well, which are looking like good value and, and starting to ride that wave of commodity price improvements. I imagine you've been busy the last uh, six months with everyone trying to get a read on this current market that we're sitting in right now. And, and, and you touched on pretty much all around the country except for uh, Melbourne and Sydney, which seems to be the, the the beacon of light that everyone's placing on Australia's property market is on Sydney and Melbourne right now. You know, you've just said that the market's a lot bigger than Sydney and Melbourne, but um, the commentary that you've been providing around the market that we're in right now and, and, and Sydney and Melbourne, I, deal, I imagine you deal with um, a lot of journalists, some of them probably a lot less educated uh, around property than people that are more educated around property and they probably go fishing for for headlines from you. Your take on how the media has approached reporting on the Sydney and Melbourne market, uh, what's your views on that? Any any criticisms or you think they've done a pretty reasonable job? Uh, I think like any industry, there's, mm. there's a whole range of, of different levels of quality. And I think the mainstream media, uh, yeah, there is a theme of these, these markets are, are, uh, are very weak. They are, absolutely. We're seeing Sydney values are down by nearly 10% since they peaked out back in the middle of 2017. Melbourne's down by nearly 5%. And I think by year's end, we'll probably see Sydney down by at least 10%. Mm. I think in that sense, the reporting is 
is is quite clear. The market's in a, in a downswing after a very long upwards trajectory. But what we have seen in some other publications, you know, uh, um, 60 Minutes is probably a really good example yeah. where we saw some some very slanted reporting, uh, a bit of cherry picking on with, with some of the analysts they used as their commentators uh, of, you know, it's, it's an absolute cataclysm in the housing market being probably the uh, the, the outcome for, for dwelling values. And the funny thing is both of the analysts being quoted in that, in that article uh, – have absolutely backtracked on on their comments um, and and suggested that probably the worst case scenario that they presented was being portrayed as the most likely outcome, which which I think certainly isn't the case. But I think we should expect this housing downturn is going to be more substantial than what we've seen in the past, mostly because the past is a really low benchmark. You know, the, the biggest downturn the Sydney market's ever seen, and our data goes back to the 1980s is during the last recession. So early 90s, we saw Sydney values fall by about 10% over about two years, about 24 months. You know, Sydney's almost down by 10% now. Uh, I think we'll absolutely see Sydney record a larger decline than 10%, probably more like 15%, and over a long time time frame as well, uh, mostly because this downturn is very different. It's, it's about credit availability. It's about uh, finance regulation. And we haven't seen the normal catalysts of a, of, of a market cycle just yet, which is typically monetary policy changes. Uh, or economic conditions uh, either worsening or improving. So we'll stick on Sydney for the moment. We'll, we'll get to Melbourne in a second. I went to a um, property uh, uh, seminar. Oh, it's not a seminar. It's not the right word. Like a, a report for people in, in, in a property industry. It's probably a little little while ago now, but whenever I go to these things, they always use your data as um, uh, the way to explain the market. So they'll have narrative and commentary around it, but it'll always be – based on what they're seeing in the data that you're providing. And I remember seeing a graph which showed a the softening of the Sydney market and and it was a it wasn't a sharp drop. It was a it was a slow downward softening in the market over probably a two year period. And the logic or the rhetoric around it was that the speed to go down to where it'll bottom will be the same as the time taken to get back to to where it started. Is that still consistent with how you guys are seeing it right now? And you know Everyone wants to try and pick the bottom of the city market. Uh, are we there yet? And um, you know, when are we going to start seeing things moving from from negative to positive in Sydney? Yeah, it's it's a great way to look at the market and look at the previous downturns mm-hmm. and the trajectory of decline, and then look at the the the, the up the upswing. Um, how long does it take property values to recover? And remarkably, you're right. It takes about the same amount of time for a property market to recover as what it did to uh, to, to reach a um, a trough. Mm. Uh, it, will, will that happen this time around? Well, if history is anything to go by, probably. Okay, but the big question is here: how how long will the, will the property market stay in a downturn? Uh, that that's probably more a question around: well, how long will finance conditions stay as tight as what they are? Uh, that's for probably the foreseeable future at the moment. Macro potential policies don't look set to be being wound back. We've got the final report being handed down from the Royal Commission, which could compound things just a little bit more. A lot of focus on uh, on on less interest only lending, less investment lending, uh, less higher LVR lending, less high debt to income ratio lending as well. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of restrictions in the marketplace that I think will continue to, to curb demand to some extent. But there's also some some good opportunities here. If you think about the market segment that's been most resilient, it's owner occupiers. We've seen a real upswing in, in first home buyer activity. Part of that's being fueled by stamp duty concessions in New South Wales and Victoria, but in a market like WA, there's been no there's been no stimulus for first home buyers, and they're nearly a quarter of all owner occupier demand, highest of any state, mostly because we've seen affordability improvements in that marketplace, yeah. and it's much easier to be active. And the same exists in Melbourne as well. Would you say the cycle of a, a downward trajectory would be complemented complemented by the same upswing time and and and, and motion? I guess. Uh, is there any reason why it would be any different to the city market? Uh, no, 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 not at all. Yeah. Obviously, each market has its own dynamic, which is mm. fueled by generally demographic trends uh, and economic conditions. Yeah. And they're, they're very different between Sydney and Melbourne. So prob- probably one of the reasons why Melbourne's been a little bit more resilient to Sydney up until recently, and we saw Melbourne continuing on, um, in terms of growth longer than what Sydney did by about six months, was that we're seeing much stronger migration trends across the Melbourne metro area, particularly interstate migration. Um, overseas population growth peaked out, starting to come down a little bit, but still very strong. But overall, Melbourne's still the population growth powerhouse of Australia, population rising by more than 2% per annum. Uh, but we're also seeing in Sydney that that exodus of interstate migrants to other regions 
is really gathering some momentum now. Mm-hmm. So we are seeing the demand pressures really starting to, 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 to come off across the Sydney market. We've got overseas migration starting to slow down, but most importantly is interstate migration is really starting to ramp up now, uh, generally moving to Queensland, some moving into, into Victoria uh, as well. So I think Melbourne probably does seem to have a better fundamental uh, than what Sydney does in terms of those demand drivers. It's also building more housing, though. So the supply side of it is still showing some imbalance, particularly around the the apartment sector, which is still, or at least based on June data, which is the Australian Bureau of Statistics construction data, we're still seeing a record number of apartments being built across Victoria, uh, a little bit more than 50,000. And that's obviously a concern for the uh, the Melbourne, good and bad, it's supply and demand. So, you know, we, we're going to need these properties at a point in time. It's just whether or not the impact that that's going to have on property prices for the immediate term. What is it about the Sydney market that concerns you the most in, in the data that you're you're receiving and, and, and synthesising and looking for trends in? Is there anything which is really alarming that uh, is either going to prolong this, this downward trend or uh, when we do return to a upward trajectory, um, that's going to really hamper the speed at which the city market can grow? I think there's probably three things, uh, two of them market-related and, and one one external. So the two market-related factors would be the fact that housing affordability is pretty shocking across Sydney. So we've got a dwelling price to income ratio in Sydney that's a little bit higher than nine times. Generally means your, your typical household have to spend nine times their gross annual household income to buy the medium price dwelling. Mm. What it probably really suggests though is that the typical household is no longer able to afford the medium price dwelling that they're targeting at the lower, uh, the middle to lower end of the marketplace. I think another factor that's quite concerning in Sydney would be the rental market. So we have seen rental demand easing off. That's that's a lot of the first home buyers moving out of becoming moving out of being renters to become first home buyers. Um, population growth easing off. So both those factors are easing rental demand right at a time when rental supplies has ramped up quite substantially on the back of a lot of construction and and such a surge in investment activity, which means rental yields are very low in Sydney as well. So rental yields are a really good barometer for for measuring what you might describe as market value and whether or not uh, values are uh, or property values are overvalued or undervalued. The yield in Sydney uh, gross is about 3.1%, mm. only fractionally off a record low. And still suggests to me now that we're seeing rents falling in Sydney, they're down about 2.5% the last 12 months, that we're not going to see any real uh, improvement in rental yields in Sydney, uh, at least over the next 12 months. And is there any particular product that uh, CoreLogic produces, any indices or or um, uh, benchmarking index that you think best represents Sydney and Melbourne markets the best way possible? So what I'm trying to get to is, I'm a property investor. I'm getting all this information. I, my head boggles, my mind boggles. Um, what would be the one or two key indices or benchmarks I should be using to help me shape my view of the market? I'll answer that one in just a second. There, yeah. there was a third element I, I should have touched yeah, on, yeah, on the yeah. last question, was the external element, which is mm. household debt. Household debt. Right. I think that's that's the, the big wild card here. We're still seeing household debt very high, household saving ratio very low. That's starting to change, even though we haven't seen uh, um, up-to-date data. I think as we see more interest-only loans being paid down and we see some some subtle rises in wages growth, we'll start to see household debt coming down. But it's going to take a long time for household debt to reduce materially. And it really implies that households are very sensitive to the cost of debt. So Mm. if we do start to see any further changes in mortgage rates, which we've seen out of cycle to the RBA, or if we start to see some upwards pressure in the cash rate, which isn't likely until at least probably late 2020, if not not later than that, then we're going to see some effect in the household sector as they dedicate more of their income to servicing the debt and less to buying stuff. Mm. 60% of the economy is consumption. So going back to your, your most recent question, what are the, some of the benchmarks that I think um, are the most relevant, the most important? Well, I think that to understand the broad trends, uh, I'd certainly recommend looking at our hedonic index. It's it's probably the, the go-to measure for understanding how values are moving okay. across a broad market. So what does that actually do, the, the, that particular so, yeah, index? Good, good yeah, good question. It's, yeah. it's a mouthful. I know mm. that. Uh, and it's quite a technical um, sophisticated index. So it's not really easy to understand unless you're a mathematician or, or a, a scientist. Head of research. Head <laughs> of research. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more a, a quant that, that, that have a much better understanding. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but here's, here's, a, here's an easy, easy way to describe it. So the hedonic index, it's simply a, a regression index. And rather than valuing or trying to measure values based on, say, a really simplistic method, method like a, a median price, median prices are really easy to understand. It's mm. just how many properties of all the properties have transacted across a region over, say, a quarter or a year, 
it's the middle price, mm. right? And but it's very compositionally biased. If you're seeing a lot of properties selling at the lower end or the upper end of the market, your median's going to move around. It's yeah. not really a very good indicator for measuring change. Great indicator for understanding the typical price of a home that's selling, but trying to compare one period to another is fraught with uh, with with, with yeah. issues. Move a step up from a median price, and you've got an index like, say, a repeat sales index. Just simply finding sale pairs um, and how much capital gain is there between the sale pairs. That gives you a pretty good indication, uh, and it removes any of the issues around compositional bias. Okay, but you're removing a massive amount of properties in the mm -hmm. marketplace that simply haven't transacted, um, and you're not counting the effect of new stock either because it needs a sales pair. You've got a stratified median as well, and that's what uh, the ABS use in, in their series. The ABS um, stratified median and our hedonic index move very, very, very closely with each other. Um, a stratified median simply tries to overcome some of the compositional bias in the marketplace by looking at the median price in different uh, different cohorts of the market and then averaging it up across the broad region. Okay, Works quite well. But the hedonic index is, is quite different. So the way the hedonic index works is we value every single property across the market, regardless of whether it's sold or not. And the way we do that is, is very similar to, say, a human valuer. We look at individual properties, look at what uh, their attributes are. This is really important for understanding value of a property. How many bedrooms does it have? How many bathrooms? What's the land area? What's the property type? What's sold around it? And from based on all that information, we can then derive an estimated value on that property. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, uh, if we see the attributes on the property change over time, then we don't include that that, that property in in the portfolio because it, we're trying to cancel out the effect of capital uh, injections, yeah. say renovations, for example, rather than pure capital growth. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, once you value every single property across the uh, consistent portfolio and you measure the change in the value of that portfolio from period to period, say day to day or month to month or quarter to quarter, it gives you a much better understanding of the true value change in a marketplace rather than the price changes, which is really what you're measuring in a medium price. Okay. So keeping on that index and anything else they invest yeah. should be? Heaps, heaps of stuff. But yeah. uh, I think a couple of the key ones would be how much stock is on the market. Okay. Right. Really, really interesting when you start looking at advertised stock levels in Sydney and Melbourne, you can see that we're starting to see real build up in inventory. Uh, not necessarily properties being added to the market really quickly. There's no dumping of stock mm. uh, by, by panicked vendors, but homes are selling uh, much slower. There's less activity in the marketplace, which means a lot more stale stock is building up. Great for buyers because you have a lot more choice. You have much less urgency. You can negotiate much harder. But uh, uh, once you start to see inventory levels rising, it's a pretty good sign that buyers are back in the driver's seat and they'll put some downwards pressure on prices. Mm. Okay, and probably the final indicator I'd be looking at would be how much activity is in the market, volume, right? And once again, really timely indicator, updated every month, and we can start to see if, if volumes are rising, that generally means there's more demand in the marketplace. It's going to start to place some upwards pressure on prices. When volumes are falling, it generally implies less demand or it could imply a shortage of supply as well. Mm. So typically, if you see volumes falling but prices rising, that would, that would suggest that there's an undersupply, uh, demand is, is exceeding supply and pushing prices higher. So I'll ask you this question that since I got in the studio because I, I, I get people writing in sometimes um, querying this and, and they'll do a um, – they're researching a property sale, they'll do a – uh, they'll get a report done on property X in Blacktown, for example, and I get a report back from CoreLogic saying, this is the market, this is the area, this is the house, here's all the attributes about it, and we reckon that it's worth between $690,000 and $800,000, but we reckon in pretty good confidence that it's worth seven seventy. dollars um, And it gets all printed out and they get it and they go, okay, well, that must be worth seven seventy. dollars the question I get asked a lot is, how do you actually work out that it is that 770 and that level of confidence? Is that drawing on the, the hedonic uh, index would be part of it? But how do you get that number and should you rely on that number? So th there's a couple of ways to answer that. So how do, how do we get the number first? Well, it's, it's through a whole series of different mathematical models, right? So a big part of our business is automated valuations, essentially using an algorithm to estimate the value of a property. So one of the big uh, the, the most, um, I suppose, um, prolific products with, with the banking sector would be an automated valuation, which they will then use to either uh, 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 fast track the, the, the mortgage application process. If you're a low risk applicant for a mortgage, getting a valuation done on the property should be pretty straightforward, particularly if it's a, if it's a, if it's a normal property. So by a normal property, I mean, it's, it's not unique. It's not a, on the, on the harbour front at, at Point Piper, for example. Yeah. Okay, how do we determine the accuracy of those valuations? Well, it comes back to data availability. 
um, and uh, I suppose that the complexity of the property as well. So I'll use a um, uh, maybe a worst case example. So the Harbourfront property at Point Piper, really hard for an algorithm to value. It's just unique. There's not a lot of surrounding sales around it. Trying to assess the value and the premium of the harbour frontage and the view and exclusivity is very hard. Generally, you'd need a human to value a property like that. But if you're buying a property out in, say, um, uh, the Hills District in a new housing estate and all the properties are very similar, uh, we know how many attributes or how many bedrooms and bathrooms and land size, everything's very available and everything's very standardised really easy for an algorithm to to value a property like that. So there's plenty of sales evidence, plenty of turnover, and there's a lot of consistency amongst the products. So then based on all those things, we, we get what's called a forecast standard deviation. It's essentially a level of volatility in the reading. And if that uh, standard deviation score is very low, then it generally means that we're very confident about the accuracy on that property. If it's very high, then it's going to have a much broader range between what we believe the, the, the upper and lower boundary on that property value is going to be. Okay, so as an investor and in, you get a core logic report and it says that there's a very high confidence that you've hit the number exactly where it should be, you should be able to go out there and bid with a fair degree of confidence that that would be the valuation that would satisfy a bank should you buy to that amount. And if you can get it cheaper than that, you're probably doing quite well. Yeah, I think I think looking at that confidence indicator is probably one of the most important parts of interpreting the valuation or the valuation estimate. Uh, if you see something with a low confidence score and a really broad range of an upper and lower boundary on on uh, on, on the valuation, obviously it's less reliable. Yeah. But, you know, interestingly, even if you get a human to value a property, there's always going to be some standard margin of error. Generally, it's it's fifteen percent built into their into their uh, into the detail of. Or the valuation. So, mm. yeah, valuation is is sometimes described as an art rather than a science. And uh, at the end of the day, the best way to determine the value of a property is well, what, what do two people agree mm. on? Mm. Uh, um, uh, the, on the contract. The, the, the value the, the, the value of a property is what someone's willing to pay for it, right? That, that's the value. But I did test test this thesis the other day, and uh, I was looking at a property, uh, Seven Hills in Sydney, and I went uh, went went to real estate dot com to do it. I had a sniff around. I knew the attributes of the property, went through everything, and I went I. I reckon that this property is worth, worth between 750 and 770 just on my mechanical uh, uh, valuation. And then um, went and got a report from CoreLogic and I had the, the the boundaries were between about 680 and maybe 810. But then it said with a high degree of confidence that it was about, I think it was about 755. And I thought, oh, that sort of matches what, yeah, I, okay. what I thought. And then I've got a couple of bank valuations. They come in at the same. So... Um, yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's, it's always worthy having a bit of caution as mm-hmm. well. So there's there's sometimes things a model doesn't know about. For example, uh, you know, is there a major highway plan to, 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 yeah. to, to run through the backyard? Yeah. Uh, is there issues with um, an easement or pollution, mm-hmm. noise pollution or, or whatever? You so, don't know. You yeah, still need the ground truth, still, right? Absolutely. You yeah. still need to, to apply your own diligence, I think, in, in these sort of decisions. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming in, Tim. It's a pleasure. Uh, always an education. Um, you know, it's it's a topsy turvy world that we're we're in right now. But it is just the property market. You know, it's it's just business as business as usual. It is what really. it is. Yeah, it's um. But we'll get you back in and uh, maybe a bit more of a regular update. Um, we've been a bit heavy on on Sydney and Melbourne. I'm conscious about that, but that's what everyone's talking about right now. So I'm happy to follow the trends. Uh, uh you covered some of the other parts of Australia, and um, I think we could probably deep dive a little bit more into those things. But uh. If you're not familiar with what the core logic guys do, just jump on the website. There's heaps of stuff there. But if you use a buyer's agent or a broker or whoever, then no doubt got a subscription core logic. So lean on them also to help you out with some uh, some some stuff from them uh, if that helps in your buying decisions. Uh, projection. Let's get a nice projection. Projection for uh, five years. Fast forward five years from today, Tim, the city market. What's going to be happening compared to where we are today? So uh, five years from now that the market would have obviously bottomed out. Yep. You know, cycles are generally – yeah, we're downturns generally somewhere between about eighteen months and and, and two and a half years. Mm. So uh, uh, clearly, the market would have bottomed out by then, unless something goes completely pear shaped. But I think the upswing from there, as we talked about, is going to be quite a gradual one. This mm. this decline we're seeing at the moment, very much a slow melt, and uh, I think the upswing is going to be quite a uh, a gradual uh, process as well. So five years from now, we may see prices roughly around what they are at the moment. And uh, you know, that's after, uh, say, a 10 to 15% decline, followed by some modest upwards growth. But a big part of that, obviously, is going to relate to, well, what happens with the economy? 
Do we see any changes to taxation policy, which which looks like it's, it's uh, potentially going to happen uh, mm. next federal election? What happens with our population growth as well? So there's a lot of factors that obviously could impact on the marketplace. But yeah, gut feel is we'll probably move through the downturn sometime in, in probably uh, uh, 2020, and we'll start to see a gradual upswing in prices. So the secret is find out where the bottom is, and you're probably guaranteed a 50% uplift in about 18 months to two and a half years, right? There you go. There. <laughs> same in Melbourne. No real changes. Just just the the, the timing of when that happens. Uh, I think I think same. Sydney and Melbourne will be quite quite similar. Even yeah. though uh, uh, the population growth and the economies are a little bit different, I think we'll probably see uh, um, both markets behaving quite similarly. Okay. And uh, if you like these sort of conversation, guys, let us know. Um, yeah, Tim would be happy to come on. Uh, and tell us what's going on. Uh, I know there's a lot of people that love the crunch of data and uh, they really get a lot of benefit out of uh, talking the numbers and uh, we obviously cover it all on smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Go and check it out. But if you want us to do more of this sort of stuff around market predictions and uh, timing of markets and the uh, the cycles of property and how to get greater insights around those cycles and how you can use that to your advantage and advantage being being a better property investor, happy to cover it. If you want us to do that, email the team, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au and we'll make that happen. Uh, Tim, thanks again, mate. Uh, or oh, yeah. it, are you Sydney-based? Are you a Sydney... No, you know? no, I'm, I'm a Queenslander. You're a Queenslander. That's why you're saying no. investing. Uh, <laughs> That's why I'm talking up <laughs> Southeast Queensland. Absolutely. <laughs> um, are, you, are you investing in property at the moment? Are you a property investor? No, we, we've actually just bought a new principal place of residence okay. and uh, we're up the Sunshine Coast. Okay, so, oh, very yeah, nice. We're, we're oh, certainly liking that great. market up there. Okay, well, we'll get that story one day, no doubt. Um, remember, we're on uh, social media. Just search Smart Property HQ. You can like us, follow us, and uh, and all that sort of stuff. Remember to press the subscribe button wherever you listen to this, so you know what's going on in property and property investment. We'll be back again next time. Until then, bye bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs, and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.